Thank you everyone for coming here. And uh, so the title of this talk is Incompatible Institutions, Socialism versus Constitutionalism in India. It's also a paper that I published a few months ago, uh, which uh, I'm sure uh, someone at IDFC can share the link. And uh, the, it, a part of the talk covers about 30 to 40 years of Indian constitutional history. And if you have any doubts or clarifications, as Justice Sri Krishna, no, I'm kidding. So uh, uh, if you have any clarificatory questions, please jump in. Uh, but like he said, if you want to ask about an entire amendment or what happened during the emergency, then you know perhaps we can wait until the end uh, where I have more time to answer it. Uh, so thanks for coming. Um, the motivation behind uh, looking at, const the motivation for this paper started with looking at constitutionalism initially, not socialism. And uh, the reason for that was I was just wondering, uh, puzzled like all of us are, when you look out of the window, why there is no rule of law in India, right? When you're doing most things and going about your day, that is something which is uh, so apparent, no matter what age you are or what walk of life you belong to. So that's where this quest started. And um, I came across this great uh, cartoon. I don't know if everyone at the back can see it. So this is a, a government publications house. And uh, the gentleman who's the customer says, may I have a copy of the Constitution? And the shopkeeper says, sorry, we don't sell periodicals. <laughs> right? Uh, this cartoon was there in Rajiv Dhawan's book called The Amendment, if someone wants to look up the original. Uh, so this was sort of where this, uh, this whole paper and this idea started that, oh, we did have rule of law, we do have a constitution, the two seem to be strongly linked to one another in the literature, but something must have happened to our constitution uh, that I didn't know much about. Uh, so I started digging more, and uh, this is when the Constitution was ratified in uh, January 1950. So the New York Times uh, editorial at the time says, the Indian Constitution is a document that the British can take pride in. It's a liberal parliamentary democracy. Those words are all the nice sounding things, right? And even Americans and Canadians would be interested that some of their practices are enshrined, and those practices they describe later in the editorial is the Bill of Rights. So it seems to have started out as a really great document, right? So what happened? Uh, the prevailing view in the literature is, and we're a country of mythology, right? So there are all these mythologies also uh, relating to the Constitution, and this is a big one. Uh, we like good versus evil, and then uh, this is one of those myths which is propagated. That Nehru was a great constitutionalist, he was there in the Constant Assembly at the time of ratification, and he really upheld the Constitution. And then in Indira Gandhi, who is of course famous for the emergency, uh, is the reason we have this kind of constitutional breakdown or deterioration in India. So this is one of the views which is prevailing in the literature, and I hope uh, to dispel it by the end of the talk. The second one uh, is that socialism and constitutionalism is so interdependent to almost be synonymous. This is a quote from Granville Austin's 1999 book, uh, uh, the working of a democratic uh, republic. And uh, it says the failure is due to lack of political will. And the lack of political will you find in Michandani, Kohli, Rajiv Dhawan, Subhash Kashyap, all of these books, the idea seems to be that socialism is a great idea, constitutionalism is a great idea, the two put together must be a fantastic idea, and the reason why things went wrong is we didn't have good political leaders and there was no uh, political will strong enough to uphold these great principles. And uh, both these views I hope to challenge through this talk. Uh, one of the main challenges will be that socialism and constitutionalism are in fact incompatible and contradictory to one another. So this started with, uh, I'm an economist by training, and it started with my understanding of the socialist calculation problem. And the famous critique of the socialist calculation problem is on the impossibility of rational calculation in planning, right? So this is Mises' famous critique in the early 20s, which says uh, rational economic planning is impossible without private property rights, you can't get prices. And without prices reflecting uh, the scarcity value, you can't get any profit and loss calculation. So you have a massive allocation problem at your hand. And Hayek, uh, 
to this critique added the last part which is because socialist calculation is so difficult or nearly impossible the socialist planners need unlimited discretion in their hands they should be able to do whatever they need to do to make sure they get the allocation right so that's the principle of planning what's the principle of constitutionalism administrators should be bound by general rules that are equally applicable to all with no discretion and no arbitrariness right so these two are in direct conflict with one another the second planning necessarily discriminates to bring about substantive inequality because the origins of planning lies in the fact that market allocation doesn't lead to equitable distribution in society right so if you want to bring about substantive equality you need to discriminate between different individuals and say the two of you are unequal in allocation and we need to bring about a more equal allocation constitution on the other hand requires equal treatment before the law another puzzle another contradiction third uh, planning requires state control over the means of production because to allocate resources within the state plan you need to control all the resources and uh, the allocation will not be through market allocation it will be through state allocation to bring about the former uh, goal which is substantive equality constitutionalism requires strong framework of individual rights and the right to private property is fundamental to all the other property rights in the constitution so this is one more contradiction and the fourth planning requires a widespread agreement not only over the idea of planning but on a particular plan that is exactly how we are going to have some kind of allocation or distribution in society in other words you need a very high degree of centralization in decision making on the other hand constitutionalism requires decision making in a more decentralized format requires democracy which separation of powers federalism all of these things are the opposite of what it requires to execute socialist calculation so this essential format or idea this is the famous mises hayek critique and hayek lays out all these ideas in his book the road to serfdom which he dedicated to socialists from all different parties now how did this play out in the indian context so first the planning commission came up with some framework of five year plans uh nehru was famous for nehru was also the chairman of the planning commission as the prime minister is and nehru was famous for writing these uh fortnightly letters to chief ministers so nehru was in constant communication with all policy makers at the central and the state government to move along legislation that was in keeping with the spirit of the plan so you have planning commission making five year plans you have legislation that would give effect to the goals or the idea of the five year plan a lot of this legislation was challenged in courts and subject to independent judicial review in india uh, much of this was shut down by the judiciary because it was unconstitutional either because uh, typically because it violated uh, the right to property under article 31 a uh, right to equality under article 14 right uh, to trade under article 19 these this trifecta was typically the issue of contention uh and once the judiciary held the legislation unconstitutional parliament had two choices they could either abandon the unconstitutional legislation or they could amend the constitution and guess which one they chose almost every time parliament decided to amend the constitution so that it could retroactively or proactively make such legislation constitutional there were some special vessels in the constitution like the ninth schedule to make these things possible and i'll discuss that just in a minute so this started with the first amendment the first amendment the first plan which there are many economists in the room you know that it wasn't really a plan the second plan is really when the centralized planning machinery started but in the first plan the chief goal was to dismantle the zamindari system and all over the first plan you see a, a footprint of this uh so this was also nehru's pet project the congress across the country had uh, campaigned on the issue of uh, land reforms and abolishing the zamindari system so this was crucial but on the other hand we had a really strong takings clause under article 31 and a strong equality clause under article 14 and in this particular instance it was a the land reform law in bihar uh, which the patna high court invalidated in a case called kameshwar singh versus state of bihar so to give that law 
constitutional validity, what Nehru's government, which at the time was the provisional parliament, so this is pre uh, the first general election. So the provisional parliament decided that it needs to extensively amend the constitution. The first amendment was one such extensive amendment and uh, it included uh, exceptions to the Zamindari estate breakdown in Article 31A and it added a really uh, perverse provision, Article 31B, which is called also related to the ninth schedule of the constitution. What Article 31B says in spirit is any law which is added to the schedule is immune from any judicial review even if it violates the fundamental rights in the Indian constitution. So almost immediately after creating the constitution, this gives you a little backdoor to get out of all the constitutional constraints that are imposed on you. And this, is, this was all not done surreptitiously. This is in the first paragraph, which is typically the statements of objects and reasons uh, of, the, uh, of the act. And it says the validity uh, uh, has formed the subject matter of dilatory litigation. It is essential to amend the constitution for securing the constitutional validity. It's a little odd in its phrasing, right? It's constitutionally valid now because we changed the constitution to make it valid. So it's an odd phrase. And zamindari abolition laws in general and certain specified acts in particular. So it's quite clear. Most people supported this amendment thinking this is just for Zamindari and you know all of us can get behind that program, we all campaign for it and everything should be fine. Nehru himself said, and this is in the uh, parliament, parliamentary debate while debating the first amendment, he said it's not with any great pleasure that we produce this long schedule. We don't wish to add to it, the schedule consists of a particular type of legislation which is land reform laws and generally speaking no other type should come in. So in the First Amendment, they added 13 laws to the Ninth Schedule. Uh, does anyone know how many laws are in the Ninth Schedule now? 282. And they are, as you can imagine, not just on land reform, right? So this essentially opened the floodgates. So coming back to the first myth that Nehru was the great constitutionalist, the deterioration came about later, you see this happening over the years over, so the First Amendment was passed in 1950. The 17th Amendment actually was introduced in Parliament uh, the day before Nehru died. So it was his last swan song in some sense. And that was passed in 1964. So the first, the policy for the First Amendment was land redistribution. It violated right to equality and property. So they amended the, the Constitution. The First Amendment uh, diluted right to private property. and included the catch-all ninth schedule. It also diluted free speech protections under Article 19 and things like that, but I won't go into that right away. Then uh, next comes price controls, right? This is after PC Man Lovis takes control of the plan. You need price controls, you need uh, uh, quantity controls. This is the typical uh, socialist you know, allocation through legislation mechanism. So you have uh, laws like the Essential Commodities Act, which typically, again, run afoul with the Constitution. They violate federalism because a lot of those laws were in the seventh schedule under the state list. And the center didn't have the power to actually legislate on that. So that was one of the issues that was fixed. And uh, Article 19, which is right, right to any occupation, trade, or business. So that was the reason we had the Third Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, uh, and by the Fourth Amendment, we're already in 1954-55, right? Even the supporters of Nehru, like B.R. Ambedkar, have started becoming a little bit um, upset, uh, which I shall come to later, about this kind of frequent amendment to what they considered a sanctimonious document. Uh, again, it's compensation for land acquisition. The idea was they, did, they wanted to acquire land, but they didn't want to pay compensation. Either that was the issue, or in some cases, they wanted to pay differential compensation, as in Kameshwar Singh. They wanted to pay 20 times more compensation to the poor farmer than to the rich zamindar. So all those things run afoul with right to equality. Then you have uh, the Seventh Amendment, which is about greater control in the hands of the central government. This is, again, you know, everything that Mises Hayek predict, you start seeing that, uh, and that's the Seventh Amendment. And by the time you have the 17th Amendment, you already, the 17th Amendment added, I think, 40 or 44 laws to the 9th Schedule. So by the time Nehru 
dies in 1964, you already have 64 laws in the ninth schedule. And 44 of those laws were added in the 17th Amendment. So they are rent control laws, tenancy laws, urban land sealing, land reform, and you also have you know, the Essential Commodities Act and things like that added into it. So these are the Nehruias. B.R. Ambedkar famously said in 1954 that they should burn the Constitution, and he got a lot of flack for it. So remember the Fourth Amendment right here, which was uh, regarding, uh, it was an interesting case in uh, UP on the Motor Vehicles Act. They basically took away the licensing for motor vehicles, and it was akin to acquisition. So that's what it was about. They were talking about this heatedly in Parliament. And Ambedkar said, yes, we should burn the Constitution. And my justification for such a strong position is, we built a temple for a god to come in and recite. But before the god could be installed, if the devil has taken possession of it, what else could we do except destroy the temple? We did not intend it should be occupied by asuras. We intended it to be occupied by devas. That is the reason I would rather like to burn it. Right after this, there's an interesting exchange. Mr. Dwivedi, another parliamentarian, this happens in the Rajya Sabha. Mr. Dwivedi says, why not just get rid of the asuras and keep the temple? And he says, we can't do it. It can't be done. We don't have the strength for it. And by now, he's directly in opposition of this kind of ever-expanding socialist state because I think Ambedkar, being the constitutionalist that he was, picked up that it was always going to be in contravention with the constitution. Then we come to the Indira Gandhi years, right? Again, now I've separated the Indira Gandhi years as pre-emergency and post-emergency because, again, to dispel the myth that all the excesses happen only during the emergency and that's what destroyed the constitution, but there was a lot that happened before that. So keeping in uh, line with what happened in the Nehru years, Indira Gandhi decided to take up socialism a few notches she introduced the 10-point program, which instead of the gradualist approach, wanted to nationalize and control all the means of production. There was a clear shift in the Indira Gandhi years in socialism from Nehruvian socialism, right? But in the midst of all this, there's some drama going on between parliament and the courts over the power to amend the constitution. And this, was, this started in the 50s with the First Amendment. But in this instance, just before the 24th Amendment, 24th Amendment, there was a case called the Golaknath case. And it was Golaknath versus State of Punjab. They were a family, nice Bengali farmers who had land in Punjab. Uh, they were farmers. The land was acquired. And it was a compensation issue. And they decided to go all the way to the Supreme Court with other parties joining in. And the question boiled down to this. Can the, power, can the parliament amend the constitution or does it not have the power to amend the constitution? So in the midst of this, in the Golaknath case, it was 11 judge bench and the Supreme Court said the parliament cannot amend fundamental rights of the constitution. So in, as a response to that, because we've already learned that you can't have full effect to socialist policy if you don't have the power to amend the constitution, immediately after the Golaknath case, Indira Gandhi set about to amend the constitution to get the right to amend the constitution. So you did hear it right. <laughs> they decided to amend the constitution to amend the constitution, right? And uh, that is the 24th amendment. And they, essentially the amendment clause is article 368. They add a little clause in the end saying, notwithstanding anything in the rest of this clause, parliament has full power to amend any part of this constitution as it wishes, right? So that was that battle. Now that she's armed with the 24th amendment and they went to elections, which if she won uh, later, starts the controversy on bank nationalization, which we were talking about earlier today actually. So Indira Gandhi decided that the most important aspect to the big plan of means of uh, uh, controlling the means of production is controlling the credit system. And India had a rich history of small private banks uh, doing very well. And they decided, they decided to nationalize a number of those banks overnight. Now, a few things happened. It's hard to nationalize banks through parliamentary debate over a few weeks because then banks will pull all their money out due to the uncertainty. So it happened overnight through ordinance. So bank nationalization was first an ordinance. Then they passed legislation to retroactively give effect from the date the ordinance happened. 
R.C. Cooper from Bombay, actually from pretty close in this area, decided to challenge this legislation and uh, challenge bank nationalization on the usual grounds, which is Article 31, which is the right to acquire property without compensation and uh, with compensation, sorry. Here they did it without. And uh, in this particular case, to overcome bank nationalization, they decided to pass the 25th Amendment. So you can see, I'm now, I've started repeating myself, right? It's, it's happening the same way over and over again. The next thing, one of the agendas in the 10-point program was to get rid of the aristocracy in India. Now, there was a clause in the constitution which would give a privy purse to all the kings who had become part of India. And this is, you know, the, when Sardar Patel was trying to bring the different uh, Indian monarchs under the same umbrella, different contracts had been struck with these different kings and they were all provided a purse. So even though that was a fraction of the fiscal problems in India, there was a huge campaign set out as if it is the aristocracy is the reason for, you know, widespread poverty in India and that we must abolish this kind of aristocracy and all the Maharajas and therefore abolish the privy purses, that is the money paid to them. So they abolished privy purses and this clause directly violated one particular thing called uh, transfer of power. They also had some small challenges with respect to right to livelihood, right to property, so on and so forth. But it was not upheld and then they passed the 26th Amendment. Immediately after this, she won uh, with a landslide victory. This was the, you know, the famous Garibi Hatao campaign in India. And then she came back in 1971 with a with huge majority. And the majority part is important because she had uh, more than 66% seats in Lok Sabha, which is the quorum to amend the constitution. You only need a majority of the uh, majority of the house to amend, but the quorum requirement is uh, two thirds. And she had that in the next election. Then comes again, you have all the urban land sealing acts. Now India is urbanizing. So a new spate of urban land sealing acts, which leads to the 29th amendment. And the 34th amendment is what leads to the Keshwan and Bharti case, which we will get to in a moment, which is again land redistribution. So by now, what's happening is the original land redistribution laws that were passed, they were clearly not very effective. Because as you know, the land reform program in India was by no means a success except in, I think, West Bengal, uh, one or two states where they actually managed to create some kind of um, uh, genuine land reform. So they decided to pass amendments to all these land reform acts, and now you have a new set of laws in all these different states which come up. That leads to the 34th Amendment. All of this is pre-emergency. The 34th Amendment is challenged. This is the famous Keshwan and Bharti case. So the next thing up in the Supreme Court is in each of these cases, does the parliament have the power to amend the constitution? And in the Keshwan and Bharti case, this was a 13 judge bench. Yes, it was a 6-7 split opinion. And uh, Justice H.R. Khanna came up with the doctrine of the basic structure. So the idea was, yes, parliament has the ability to uh, amend the constitution. But there is one part of the constitution which is so basic and so sacrosanct that nobody can amend it. Now, the interesting thing about the Keshwan and Bharti case is the, uh, the justices did not define what the basic structure is. They alluded to it, things like fundamental rights and separation of powers, independent judiciary, but they said we will not provide an exhaustive list and we will look at it in a case-by-case -case basis. So once again, in the seesaw of who gets to amend the constitution, the power is back in the hands of parliament, but it is a... Uh, conditional power. It's not an absolute power. In, in the midst of all this, in a New York Times interview, when they questioned Indira Gandhi about her socialism, this is of, of course when uh, after independence had been declared, she said we should be vigilant to see that our march to progress is not hampered in the name of the Constitution. So I am not the only one anymore who's saying that constitutionalism and socialism are incompatible, they recognized it themselves, right? And they say that in this battle, socialism must clearly win. We must not let the constitution get, uh, uh, our march to progress is not hampered in the name of the constitution. Now we come to the emergency years, which is obviously the worst time in India. Uh, the emergency, as most of you know, was uh, an interesting uh, uh, 
I would just say fate at this point because it, it was caused by an offense that Indira Gandhi committed in terms of election malpractice, right? And the election malpractice, uh, it got challenged in the Allahabad High Court. Raj Narayan was the other candidate and he said the, there were a few government jeeps that were used in the election campaign. So Mrs. Gandhi's campaign and therefore her seat uh, in parliament should be invalidated. Allahabad High Court upheld this and said that Mrs. Gandhi must resign. Now, remember the ninth schedule, which was the back door to put all kinds of land reform, nothing else should come in except land reform and only land reform. And then you saw all these other things come in. The ninth schedule was put to its most perverse use uh, during the emergency. Because immediately after declaring emergency, Mrs. Gandhi amended the Representation of People's Act and the Election Act and both of those amendments were thrown in the ninth schedule and therefore could not be challenged before an independent judiciary, right? So now you see all of Hayek's prophecy uh, uh, coming true uh, in its worst form. The second thing that happened in the 39th amendment is by now, I mean, that was just a side issue which was distracting and her seat was challenged, but she was in full flow towards complete socialism. So you had a spate of nationalizations. You had copper mines nationalized, coke and coal mines nationalized, textiles. textiles. This is uh, led to the famous Minerva Mills case. So there's an act called uh, the Sick Textiles Companies Act, which nationalized a number of textile companies. At one point, there was a particular law in the ninth schedule called the Alcock Ash, Ash Law. Ashlock, um, Ashdown. Ashdown. Okay. Yes, that was the nationalization. This was a law. Again, it violates every constitutional principle because a law was passed to nationalize one company, right? So now we are no longer bound by general rules equally applicable to everyone. We have now started passing laws to acquire single companies because they refuse to sell. So we've clearly had a, a, an immense deterioration in constitutionalism. The next set of nationalizations and restrictions were FERA, FEMA, MRTP, all of those go in the 40th Amendment, right? So FERA, MRTP, Monopoly Restrictive Trade Practices, uh, that was this vile law, uh, which was apparently against monopolies, but it was really against livelihood, right? Nobody could really start their own firm, run their own firm. So this was a direct challenge to Article 19. And so all of these laws which were being challenged in state high courts got thrown in the ninth schedule in the 40th Amendment. This is all during the emergency. The 42nd Amendment is typically what, you know, the myth that is propagated that the Constitution deteriorated under Mrs. Gandhi and the emergency, that's because of the 42nd Amendment. It was a, virtually a complete rewrite of the Constitution. There was a gentleman called uh, Mr. Swaran Singh. Uh, may he not rest in peace. <laughs> he wrote a report called the Swaran Singh Report, which told us how we must rewrite the Constitution. And uh, based on the Swaran Singh Committee report, they decided to create the 42nd Amendment. And the 42nd Amendment said that the uh, judiciary will be circumscribed, right? Parliament will be supreme. Uh, democratic elections were problematic because they said that the one of the things in the 42nd Amendment and the 39th Amendment was the prime minister's office is protected from any challenge before a court of law, no matter what. So now we are getting closer and closer to some kind of dictatorship. Uh, fundamental rights were circumscribed. In the 25th Amendment, there was a, a, a small uh, part which I didn't discuss, which I'll discuss more in the Q&A, I hope. And then also in the 42nd Amendment, which said earlier in the original constitution, fundamental rights were supreme. And directive principles were subordinate and not enforceable. Right? Uh, many of you in Bombay must know of Mr. H.M. Sirvai, uh, the great jurist. He was the one who spent, I think, his lifetime defending this proposition that fundamental rights must be supreme and directive principles are not enforceable. And uh, 25th Amendment said under Article 31C that fundamental rights are subject to directive principles. And even though that is now a little bit circumscribed because of the Keshwan and Bharti interpretation, that clause is still on the books. It's not been repealed. So all these things were happening. Then we know after the 42nd Amendment, Mrs. Gandhi decided to hold elections. Uh, she lost. She also lost her own seat in which Raj Narayan, the person who challenged her seat in the first place, won. He was a socialist, uh, a Gandhian socialist. And uh, so he won that particular seat in Raibareli. Uh, 
And then post-emergency, you have the Murarji Desai government. They passed two amendments. One is the 43rd Amendment where they try to undo a lot of things that the 42nd Amendment did. And they do it quite successfully. So things like uh, getting rid of independent judicial review or separation of powers, they managed to unwind all those excesses. But the 44th Amendment, and again, this is why I say socialism is in conflict with constitutionalism, not Nehru or not Indira Gandhi or not Murarji Desai, but just executing socialist policy. Now, Murarji Desai, and uh, in this case, the Janta Party decided to follow Jay Prakash Narayan's 15-point socialist program, which was not that different, actually, from Mrs. Gandhi's 10-point socialist program. They're quite similar in the, in the sorts of things they want to do in India. And they said that uh, we want to nationalize means of production and to have full-blown socialism, Gandhian socialism, not Soviet socialism in this case. Uh, we must delete the right to private property. So in 1978, Article 31 is deleted. So this is sort of the history. Now, post-1980s, when Mrs. Gandhi comes back, we know that she's no longer committed to the socialist agenda. We start having reforms by stealth. And there is also a debate on this when the reforms really began. Uh, so even though the jury is out on when the reforms really began, I think the high point of socialism ended in about... 1980, 1981. So these amendments, uh, about 13 of them, I think, that I've gone over, out of the 44, were direct challenges to fundamental rights and also amended very important clauses like federalism, separation of powers, independent judiciary, so on and so forth. Uh, oh yeah, this is uh, in the Statement of Objects and Reasons in the 44th Amendment. So he just said, the right to property, which has been the occasion for more than one amendment of the Constitution, would cease to be a fundamental right. As if the right to property is the problem <laughs> and has led to constitutional amendment and not socialist policy has led. So it's just interesting how socialists may view this differently. Now, I have a happy picture of Hayek, uh, not because he was happy that any, any of this would have happened, uh, but because he predicted this in 1944 when he wrote The Road to Serfdom. Right? And the road to serfdom is, is actually a direct conversation. At the time, he was at the LSE, uh, which was also the home of the Fabian Socialists, which is the format we followed in India. And this was a direct warning in the conversation he was having with British socialists that you can't have both. You can't have democra democracy, constitutionalism, individual rights, and also have socialism. Uh, one or the other is going to end up getting deteriorated. So the clash between planning and democracy arises simply from the fact that the latter is an obstacle to the suppression of freedom which the direction of economic activity requires. Right? Why does any of this matter? This matters for two reasons. One, it serves as an important warning that we shouldn't have incongruous institutions. So this is more from a political economy point of view. If we have certain ideas about what kind of institutions are required for economic growth, then we know that this, this incongruous institutions doesn't really work well. So just because you find two ideas and you like both ideas doesn't mean the two will go together. And there needs to be some consistency in your institutional framework. So at the very least, no matter which side of the political or economic spectrum you reside in, this is an important cautionary tale that the Indian story tells us. The second is much more important. Now we have a lot of new literature in political economy on what are the ingredients for economic growth. And repeatedly, economists will tell you, you need strong property rights, you need judicial enforcement of contracts, and you need a rule of law, which is like stable law, right? And because we don't have these things, if we move to a full-blown capitalist economy as we are transitioning now, we simply don't have the institutional structure to make sure that it doesn't devolve into crony capitalism. We've already destroyed a lot of the stable rules framework and moved towards a discretionary and arbitrary rule framework, which we will witness if we don't fix the framework that we will move from crony socialism to some form of crony capitalism. Uh, I'll end my talk here. And uh, any questions 